on the podcast, we have Jeremy from Red Means Recording. You may have seen some of his videos featuring Teenage Engineering OP1. You may have seen his educational content with Arteria Pigments, which is some of my favorite. Uh, welcome to the pod, Jeremy. Hey, thanks for having me. Welcome. So the first question I have for you is, are you from a musical family? And what was the role of music in the early years of your life? Mm. Not a musical family, uh, as far as I know. Um, none of my parents played an instrument, but they like my aunt had a flute. That's how <laughs> that's how I started music. Uh, okay. she, she had played flute, I guess, when she was much younger, and that was the instrument that I started with. Uh, so she she never played, you know, around me, but um, she had the flute lying around, and that was what started me down the path of of all this. Um, as for like what role music played, a huge. Like, I remember really getting into some of my dad's uh, albums uh, when I was a kid. Like, he had uh, Depeche Mode stuff. He had uh, some Tori Amos um, and some other stuff that, like, I really gravitated towards that really shaped how I, you know, I mean, obviously Depeche Mode, like, super, super classic electro and electronic uh, sort of pop, which I love to death. And then Tori really, really inspired me to play piano, which uh, we had an upright piano in the house. Okay. Um, I don't know why. I have no idea why. <laughs> I just thought it looked good. Furniture, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that furniture, uh, I, I grew to just love to death. And I, I basically just sat down on it every day and, and played around and, and had a great time. Nice. And you were a classical flautist, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I did. I was I was on the track to be a uh, a music performance major. Um, you know, did did the whole private lessons tried to uh, jockey for first chair in all of the, you know, high school, middle school stuff um, yeah. and did youth symphony in Tacoma where I, I grew up. Um, and then I got to college and uh, through various, you know, things basically decided that this was not something I wanted to pursue as my career uh, anymore. Um, but on the side of that, I was also like diving super deep into whatever uh, music technology and studio technology stuff I could get a hold of. That was clearly becoming the thing that I really, really loved. And how did you get from that part of music to doing electronic music to doing YouTube? Uh, I got introduced. I don't know what this class was. I don't even know if this was the focus of the class, but in my senior year of high school, we had a class and, and part of it, uh, they showed us uh, trackers, like like Fast Tracker, um, which is, a, in case people listening don't know, is like a still very popular way of making music. Uh, it's, it's a sort of downward linear um, series of tracks that you put events in. Uh, it's really, really fun and flexible once you get to know it. Um, so I got introduced to that in my senior year of high school. And I think, I think there was something about, you know, being able to actually make an entire piece of music as opposed to just being a solo monophonic player in a larger uh, a larger thing was just intensely exciting to me. So I, I just immediately started spending almost all my time using the tracker software to mess around and stuff like that. And then, like I said, in college, uh, I started, you know, using FL Studio a bit more. I would sneak into like the, uh, the computer lab there because I didn't have a computer in my dorm room and, and like I installed uh, trackers and FL studio on it and started messing around with that. Um, and then also like took a class on the, uh, the recording studio we had there at the college and just like, I was super, super into like Psytrance at the time. Like there was a big Psytrance community in the school I went to in Redlands, California. Um, so a lot of desert parties, a lot of like, there was a couple producers that, that like went to the school. So there was a bit of a like community aspect to it. That was really, really neat. And that was really, really encouraging and just amazing to hear that music uh, on large speakers sort of like really, really made a big difference in how I, you know, saw electronic music in general. Also the production stuff and that was crazy, you know, like it just there's so much production that goes into that kind of music. It's cool seeing people react to the music too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. It, it shows that like, oh, this isn't just something that you like put on and have emotions to. Like there's sort of like an actual power to decibels arriving at your body in a certain way, <laughs> yeah, which is, which, yep, exactly. Which is something that like electronic music and, uh, dance music specifically has always struck me as, is very, very interesting that like it takes sound out of the conceptual and puts it into the physical. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's how it goes. 
Uh, so anyways, you know, I, I only went to college for a year there um, and then came back and uh, eventually went to audio production school at the Art Institute in Seattle, which uh, at the time was one of the only places you could actually do that. Um, and just kept on producing. Uh, you know, my stuff at that point was still not very good at all, <laughs> but I just kept on doing it. It was it was the thing that made me happy. Um, and then eventually, uh, you know, many, many years later, um, I, you know, I had the OP1. I'd had it for a while and made a video and uh, it got way more views than I expected it to. And yeah. I sort of, I, this was a while ago, like 2012. Um I didn't really understand YouTube as a platform in the way that I do it now, in the way that I do now. So I just saw the line go up and I was like, hey, if people like this, what are, why don't I do another one? And then right. it kind of snowballed from there. Um, and then eventually the OP1 became a little stale for me. And I tried to pivot to what you said earlier, like sort of more of the uh, educational content, um, but still obviously, you know, performance and composition focus. Cause you know, if you're just talking about stuff, you're not practicing it and you're not actually like getting better at it. Mm -hmm. Totally. Uh, yeah. We talk about that. You can't pick what you're famous for on YouTube. And <laughs> it's, it's like yeah. our most viewed video or one of our most viewed videos is a PC building a PC for production. And we're mm. like, we're not the people you want to be watching for this video. <laughs> we just happen to mm -hmm. make this video and we really wish you weren't watching this video. Uh, yeah. and, and so like when I go to your most popular, it's like, OP1, OP1, and then yeah, you know, it's not for the most part. It's not anything that you've done recently, yeah. and and like you have to evolve. Even though if you just wanted to feed the algorithm over and over, you would just put out millions of the same kind of videos. Yep. And um, I really enjoy your educational stuff the most. Like I really like the stuff you do with the Micro Freak. You were the mm -hmm. reason I bought the Micro Freak behind me. And mm. Pigments is my favorite VST. Pigments scent. is so cool. It's yeah, just yeah. ridiculous. And you did a deep dive on like ozone mastering. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of stuff is is much more valuable to me rather than like the entertainment value of how to use the gear. Although, like it's really it's really fun seeing other people's creative process as well. Mm -hmm. There's there's this thing that happened during the OP1 videos where. Uh, in case people aren't watching, basically what I would do is I would I would start from scratch. I mean, there'd be some preparation beforehand, but uh, there'd be nothing on the timeline of the OP1, so to speak. And I, I'd compose in the OP1, you know, basically a, a full track and then uh, put text on screen that was mostly kind of like explaining what I was doing, but like weird. I mean, there was one thing about the OP1 videos that was fun was that I got to be extremely weird and I kept weirder and weirder as they went on because right. I was just like, this is, this is all I have. <laughs> um, but what I found was that a lot of people were asking questions that were related to the techniques. Like they were asking technical questions, like, mm -hmm. like music uh, related questions, technical questions about what was going on in the productions. And so I started adding more sort of peppering and more information, more uh, educational information about what I was doing. And the pivot to more educational content in general was just seeing the comments on YouTube from people on any video that I put out asking about how something was done. How did you do this? Like, what was what was the you know effect you used here, blah, blah, blah. And I realized that there's a huge amount of people that want to learn. Um, and I mean, there's, it's not like we don't have a lot of uh, educational content on YouTube for music, but you sort of have to like narrow your focus a little bit and kind of just like see you have to, you have to pick a direction, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I don't really look at analytics or, or follow, uh, follow the, I, I can't take in the entire ecosystem of YouTube and ask myself what's not being done because that's an insane proposition. Um, so I really just kind of focus on what I see in the, uh, in the comments and mm -hmm. try to address uh, that stuff. So like the ozone videos, the VCB rack videos, uh, you know, a lot of stuff like that comes from that interaction with the community and seeing what people want to learn. Yeah, totally. That's cool. That's cool because it's showing that you're engaging with your community as well. You're not just like, you're actually listening, which is good because that helps people want to be more interactive and theoretically. You know, yeah. Yeah. And it's cool. It's like, well, all right, you guys are giving me all these great ideas. I don't really need to like sit and, you know, brainstorm that much harder <laughs> because you're just like, all right, yo, you get all these good ideas and keeps the ball rolling. Yeah. 
As long as you're having fun making them. That is a definitely a big component of it to make sure that you don't get burnt out and make sure that you're actually doing what you want to do too. Right. So I watched one of your Q&A videos and you said you were going full time with Red Means recording early-ish 2020 um, mm-hmm. and you were a video editor before that. So how was that transition? Uh, it feels like it's still happening. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I... I uh, Video editing was one of those things that I kind of picked up on the side um, during audio engineering school. Uh, I also really, really love the idea of making videos. I love music videos like to death, like they are in part of my DNA. Uh, A lot of the music that I find I consume via music video first because I just love the potent combination of like a an interesting video plus a really good track. So uh, video editing, motion graphics and uh, a little bit of um, C4D, like 3D stuff, I kind of taught myself and then. I hadn't really worked as a video editor up until that job, um, but I cut my teeth on a lot of stuff, projects out there for people because the YouTube sort of became a calling card for my editing skills, Yeah, um, which was cool. Um, So yeah, I I had worked at this video production company in Bellevue here uh, for five years or so, a long time, and then got fired at the beginning of the pandemic. It was Mm. like, you know what? Uh, People have... I think I think I looked at my Patreon, which is my primary source of income, basically, and I was like, I can get by for a little bit, um, and I'm going to see how that works. And then my Discord, uh, really really great community there. People were talking about like, well, lessons. Like, have you ever considered like doing music production lessons? And I was like, that sounds like a lot, but let's give it a try. I did a couple of lessons with people in my Discord, yeah, and found out that uh, it was okay. Like it could actually work just fine. Um, so I have made that sort of my primary stream of revenue, for lack of a way of putting it. Um, it's where most of the money on my Patreon is coming from at this point. Um, and then, you know, there's a la carte lessons available too. So pivoting to education seemed like a really good fit. You know, I was already doing it on YouTube. All I needed to do was do it one-on-one with people and do the same thing. Um, And that's basically what it's like. It's like, yeah, I've done a lot of videos about stuff that people ask me about, but the ability to ask me questions directly uh, so that you can make you can you can sort of get the information in your head in a way that suits you versus getting it via um, you know this other format. Like everyone learns differently, basically. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how it went, um, and that's how it is right now. Like uh, I you know I do the lessons um, five six days a week, and oh. uh, the rest of the time is spent doing. Um, production for YouTube, uh, you know, every once in a while I make music for myself. Like <laughs> it's, it's actually a pretty good flow overall. I'm just like, it, it seems just crazy to be able to do this kind of stuff full time. Like it's, it's very surreal. Yeah. We talk about that. If you're doing music full time in any capacity, you're winning. Like that's, yep. it's, a, it's a small fraction of the world that's doing that. So, yeah. uh, we just started a discord um, that's just a free Discord for Sound Iron. So I was gonna ask if you have any advice on like building a good community and like engaging, making things interesting for people to come back to. Sure. Uh, yeah. So the Discord was something that actually got set up before my Patreon. Uh, it is it is pay locked behind the Patreon. It's one of those perks, which actually helps keep it very good chill. Yeah. (laughs) Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's an incredible community. Um, and I, I think it's in part because of that, but it's also in part because of our mod, um, who set it up. Actually, he wanted to set up, set me up a discord. Um, and I was like, I don't know if I have time to be part of something like that. Let's give it a try. And again, it turned out to be great. Like every single time I have like a worry about something, I do have to, I'm getting more and more like sort of just like say yes to it and see how it works out. Um, You can Mm -hmm. always, it's probably not going to be a disaster and it actually turned out to be really, really good. So uh, uh, yeah, Armad, he set up this discord. Um, He is pretty savvy. Like I think he mods a few discords and knows about like, uh, like the, the bots and stuff that are kind of fun to add and stuff like that. Um, I'd say try to keep your, one of the main things is try to keep your channels rather succinct like you don't you don't want so many channels and that are hyper specialized to the point where like it's it's impossible to navigate but you also don't want conversations to end up sort of like bleeding into like crazy alternate subjects in in various places so a lot of people who join 
or excuse me, a lot of people who are online, just a lot of people in general are sort of like adverse to overstimulation. So yeah. that's a, it's a big part of, uh, I think keeping the discord sort of like trim and, and slim and, you know, well designed in that respect. Mm -hmm. In terms of engagement, one thing we've done in my discord was like remix compilations. Um, actually there's a discord called, uh, it's from a guy named Easybot. He's a local guy that does like Octatrack stuff. Really, really great guy. Works at our local synth store. His Discord regularly does like compilations. Like oh, okay. they like will have people from the Discord make a track with a certain theme. Um, and then they'll put it out and uh, the, the proceeds go to like a charity or something like that. I always thought that was a really, really cool idea to keep people engaged. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. But yeah, good moderation, a good organized structure for it. And, you know, you leveraging what, you all do and create in a way that, uh, the community can, you know, work with it and have fun with it, I guess. Awesome, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. Could you share some insight into your creative process? Like how you start a YouTube video typically? Hmm. Uh, I started by saying, hi, this is Jeremy. And <laughs> right. Welcome to Red Means. <laughs> um, <laughs> so some videos take more planning than others. Um, for instance, the video I had to publish uh, before we started talking today is for a an app. Uh, it's a it's a what do you call it? It's not a compilation. <laughs> it's a it's a project that uh, paired teenage engineering with Google uh, Android to make a pixel version, an Android app version of their uh, P O thirty three, the K O, the sampler one, okay. which uh, in my opinion is the most fun one. Um, and they wanted it to be kind of like the official walkthrough for it. Uh, I think they're even linking it from the app. I had done a bunch of pocket operator walkthroughs uh, when I had them. And, uh, you know, I think they saw that and were like, hey, maybe maybe this person would be a good thing for that. So for a video like that, I actually make an outline. I need to make sure that I say everything I need to. And I try to make sure that I say it in an order that uh, makes logical sense, like almost like as if you were using the app or using the device, what would you want to do first, followed by what you'd want to do second, third, you know, sort of building your way up from the basic functionality, giving people a sort of aha moment, and then moving on to more complicated functionality that they might be thinking about next. A lot of the times though, it's sort of just a, you know, I have a piece of gear um, and I want to talk about it. And I spend about a week usually on average getting to know the piece of gear, um, getting to know the edge cases, getting to know what makes it special um, and uh, how to navigate it. And then when I feel like I'm competent and I have some time, I sit down and I show it off. Um, but with a more mental checklist of what I need to show off, sort of knowing that, you know, it's, it's the same thing like with the with the outline. It's just it exists in my head as opposed to existing like on a document. Um, after the video is actually shot, um, you know, the editing process is usually pretty quick. I'm at this point a really, really fast editor and uh, just try to make it snappy, um, uh, but also, you know, watchable. Uh, there's usually a pass where uh, I do uh, content cut, which is basically like no graphics or any kind of like push-ins or anything like that. And then the second pass is both a sort of like, let's, you know, move stuff around on screen or zoom where it needs to be. And also, uh, you know, maybe clean up a few things now and then. Um, and then the third pass is like any kind of fancy stuff I might want to do with graphics or anything like that. Does, do that, does use, that answer your question or? It does. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Do you use DaVinci Resolve or what are you using? No, I've been a, uh, once, once Final Cut switched from Final Cut Pro back in the day to Final Cut X, I jumped ship for Adobe. Okay. Um, and yeah, I've been, I've been a premier, uh, a premier boy, uh, plus After Effects. Cause you know, like mm -hmm. it, there's nothing else that does what After Effects does to an extent, um, since then. So yeah, I, I know. I felt like uh, a big deal when I when I went from pirating it to actually like, like <laughs> subscribing to it. <laughs> uh, the, I, I saw your tweet the other day about um, Pro Tools switching from Perpetual License. Oh, like, God. You're, you're morally obligated to, to pirate Pro Tools now. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want to, uh, but... <laughs> Yeah, it just gets worse and worse. Yeah. We had to, we had to, since I went to audio engineering school, you know, I, I, I did learn pro tools back in yep. the day. And the only times I've used it has been in a like extremely professional studio, like, like, uh, audio environment. So like, mm -hmm. you know, I was on tour with, with Boz Skaggs for a while and we used it there. Boz used it in his studio. It's like, it's hard to imagine like someone like that using Ableton or, but like, 
you know, logic exists. And I'm like, why does this still have a stranglehold on the market? It's so weird to me. Yeah. It's just- yeah. Like, it's funny. We were talking about this at NAM. how like, you know, a lot of people just use it, but there's so many people that complain about it. And it's like, how is it this industry standard? Yet there's so many people that are like fucking crashes on me, the bugs and this and that and blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, I don't know. It's, it's just- what's doubly strange about this is, so I was having a conversation with somebody recently about how Adobe doesn't care that much about piracy of their products. Because if somebody gets a hold, if a kid gets a hold of a cracked version of Photoshop and is like actually going to learn it because they want to, and, and maybe, maybe they'll go into a, you know, career of design or, or ph- photography or whatever, something that uses the app. Mm-hmm. Like basically they put so much time into it through the cracked version that down the line, they will end up buying it. And that's mm-hmm. honestly, I can, that's what happened with me in Ableton. And that's what yeah. happened with me in the Adobe stuff is like, I was, a, I was poor, young and like cracked everything I used. And eventually like, uh, the crack stopped working. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> fuck it. I'm a big boy now. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> They're playing the long game. They are. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> uh, could you tell us about a personal project you're excited about? Mm. Um, let's see. Personal projects. Those are so rare. I guess a big one on the horizon right now is I've been asked to play uh, this thing called Velocity here in Seattle in uh, September. Um, it's it, the last one uh, was before the pandemic. Like it's the first one was before the pandemic, right before, and then they haven't been able to have another one since. Right. And uh, it's our sort of like local super booth or local like tiny little like synth uh, convention thing. Um, Patchworks, our local store is involved with it. Um, and we're getting some people like Richard Devine and and some other, uh, you know, cool people to play. Um, so I haven't really played a lot of live music in front of people, especially with modular. So I'm excited about that. Uh, I have the rack set up. Um, I just need to start like, you know, building building kits for the drums and uh, and working on the patterns and stuff like that. Um, trying not to procrastinate, but like it's, <laughs> it's, it's in September. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah, I'm excited. Oh, it's going to creep up on you, man. Oh, I would know. I mean, my, my work is so close to play for me. Like uh, I like almost everything that I do as part of what I do here. So I don't know. I, I guess I kind of take it all personally. It's 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 fun. When you feel overwhelmed or unfocused, what do you do? Like if you need a break, mm. what's your what's your outlet? Do you mean like a like a temporary break? Yeah. Uh, generally, like a walk or uh, a run or something like that. Um, though the switch is a great uh, little little like brain unfreezer. Um, so having having some kind of game that I can like just sit and like mash buttons on for a little bit to take a take a break is is great. Um, I was playing the hell out of Hades for a while and then recently like got Bayonetta 2 and like playing through all the levels on hard just it's something you can sit down and pick up and and mash and then like you know get back to work when you feel like you've done enough. Right. <laughs> Reset a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um could you tell us about your office slash studio and maybe the islands slash stations that you've got going? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm sitting at my com- my computer, my DAW area. Uh, it's a it's like a custom built PC uh, or self built PC, I guess, uh, like a i nine with a fair amount of RAM. Um, I recently got a new audio interface. Uh, I got an RME Firefox Fireface UFX plus, which is just nuts in terms of its latency and, and quality. Like I'm, I'm astounded at how good the drivers are in this thing in terms of latency. How many inputs? Uh, this one has, it, it's like, in, it's overkill for me. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it has, um, uh, it looks like 12 analog inputs, but then it's got ADA and MADI. So like you can, I think you can put like I don't know. It looks like it uh, 64 maybe. Wow. Uh it it's yeah, it's it's absolutely overkill. Um but I my trusty Focusrite Claret um 8 Pre uh the power supply on it just one day decided to magic spoke on me. Um <laughs> I will say though, uh, I w- I managed to find a, a new power supply for that thing and switched it out and it was not only easy as hell and rather inexpensive, um but it, it worked after that. So like 64 bucks took a thing that 
cost like 900 new, uh, you know, and, and repaired it. And so that's, that's pretty awesome. Like, that's like, really cool. You can do uh, a little bit of work on, on your own thing. I mean, my, my partner really helped me out. He's uh, more into electric stuff. So he brought his, uh, his multimeter and stuff in there and tested a bunch of leads and we were able to tell that it was the power supply. That's um, really cool. Yeah. But the, the fire faces, like in terms of the, uh, the quality of the, like I said, the drivers and then the, um, like the timing crystals inside are just like a level two or three beyond like what I had in the Claret. So the soundstage is just like, it's, it's noticeably better, which is weird to think about. Um, I got a pair of Atom S2Vs. Do you find that you use the monitors a lot or are you in headphones? I'm in headphones. Yeah. It's that's ridiculous. How, that's how I am. Yeah. I like, I mean, I, it's nice to have them. Um, it's dumb to have really nice monitors like this when <laughs> I don't like use them enough to like really have a, you know, like you have to know your, your, uh, your monitoring equipment really well for it to matter. Right. Like that's, it, it almost doesn't matter so much like what it is as, as it is that you know it. Yeah. So <laughs> at this point, like I know my, my bear dynamic, uh, you know, DT seven seventies and my AT, whatever the hell AKG, uh, M50Xs, like I know how those sound um, to the point where it's just like, why take them off? <laughs> right. Uh, I don't have to worry about the room and all that stuff at that point, you know? Yeah, we joke about expensive props behind us. Like uh, the circuit is expensive, uh, colored lights. and the, It looks yeah. good. It looks <laughs> Yamaha good. HS8s is just like, it's an expensive prop looking back there, but they, yeah. they don't get turned on all that often. Every once in a while, you know, it's good to do a little sanity check. I actually, I have a pair of oven tones, which I almost use more uh, yeah. because I know that I, I they're, they're so specific and colored in terms of like their, you know, tiny little single driver shittiness that right. uh, especially for like vocals and mid range, they're, they're gold, like, you know, and they're very different than like really nice headphones. Like they just, you know, obviously bring out almost probably like the Yamaha, like old NS tens, like would like a very specific brittleness or mid range kind of problem. Or doing so, the car test. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Plus they're cute. They're a little, little cute. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, that's what's going on over here. I actually have the same, um, the same native instruments keyboard that you have, uh, right here in front of me. Um, so that's the doll setup. Uh, you know, all the mixing and mastering happens here. Um, this, can you see all the stations? Uh, you can see this one, the big, the big modular station. Mm -hmm. um, this is where the the modular thing started, and uh, I'm kind of lucky because my uh, a friend of my Discord built this piece of furniture that you see. Oh, go ahead, move that. It's, uh, it's a custom piece of furniture that fits the dual tip top mantis cases that I have plus accessories Sweet. with no room for growth, which is. <laughs> really important with modular. <laughs> like I, I, I could go bigger, but I'd have to get rid of the piece of furniture and I refuse to do that. So it's, it's kind of nice to have a bound on the size that that particular system can grow. Mm -hmm. Um, there's an analog rhythm here, uh, a, uh, Waldorf Blofeld for right now. I'm running it through the hologram microcosm because it's, that's a just insane combination of pretty sound design. Um, there's a innovation peak up there for uh more normal synth duties and then i've been rocking the square pay packs uh you can't see any of this shit uh, i've been rocking <laughs> the square pay packs is my main um sequencer over there uh that goes into a zoom um l12 uh the live track 12 which is actually pretty great i recommend it to a lot of people who are looking for more than eight inputs um and also like the tactileness of a mixer yeah. uh it's it's a pretty great piece of kit for the price especially um, and then the station that is, you can see the edge of it right here. Uh, mm -hmm. that's the main like downward facing, uh, table, um, for recording like gear and stuff like that. Uh, it's an audio fuse pro from Arturia and a laptop and that audio fuse pro it's cool as hell. It's one of the only audio interfaces, uh, I know of that has a digital loopback built into it and you can set a Q mix, you can pull from one of the Q mixes and create a digital loopback mix that you can then send to like OBS or uh, other things, which nice. is 
if anyone here has ever tried to pipe high quality and like low latency <laughs> audio into streaming, me, <laughs> it is hell. It is it is one of the worst experiences you could ever try to do. Yeah, it is just... a it is a it is a fucking nightmare, man. That's why, like, yeah, like when I when I hear anything with loopback, like that's the reason I got this interface mm -hmm. because it, it, in the software there's a loopback, and I think the. The RME has a loopback in the software too, right? It's got to, yeah. I mean, I the the I haven't dived into it too much, but yeah, there's no way it doesn't. Like it 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 has to. Yeah, and it's just like it's such a simple thing of just clicking, like engaging it or turning it off. You, mm -hmm. you have to be careful though if if it's on and you're like doing some like audio stuff with audio tracks in your DAW though. You mm. need some like gnarly feedback loop. Like one time I was like recording some some acoustic guitar or something that's like, and started like <laughs> oh my god i started like like my computer's gonna blow up or yeah, something yeah but yeah it's a yeah it's a beautiful feature when when anything has it yeah it's such a simple thing too i mean the the sharing of drivers between like i, I don't know if y'all are on windows or os x looks like i see os x up there uh possibly anyways like there the the, the way that windows drivers and Osio drivers basically don't touch each other. Like they're two separate things. Um, like you have to have for your Windows system, you have to have like the WDM drivers working on the thing. And then like, you know, your pro your program, you obviously want to use Asio. It's different on Mac. Like you can just use uh what the hell is it called? Core audio for everything, I guess. Right. Which is pretty chill. But the separation of those two things and the way that like programs like OBS and stuff like that, like basically don't natively speak ASIO at all means that, yeah, you got to do some kind of trickery to get it to work. Yeah, there's there's a lot more software that works better on on Mac for doing any kind of like I used to use Soundflower when yep. I had my iMac back in the day. Loopback uh, continues oh, yeah, to loop rock, back. by the way. Yeah, mm -hmm. Loopback's great. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people using that one too. Yeah, but like Windows is like, yeah, like voice meter <laughs> digital cable like, oh the, god it's just like yeah. <laughs> and it's just way too many things to maintain i just like turning loop back on and yep what uh forward. what interface are you using for that uh i'm using the it's the steinberg you oh yeah 816 c yeah yeah cool and, um, i didn't realize that i had that that's a great feature yeah that was one of the one of the things that i saw when when i was looking through them because i wanted to get something new and i saw that on there and it was like you know and they're like marketing it toward, you know, a lot of people who do like live streaming and, and stuff mm. like that. So I was just like, that's the one I want. <laughs> that's a pretty uh, affordable interface too. So people, people listening, take note. That's a good feature to have uh, yeah. <laughs> people yeah. that don't Especially put that into your interfaces. Please take note and put it into your interfaces. Yeah. It, it just kind of, it's one of those things that makes sense to do it. Like there's no reason not to, if you yeah. can, but yeah. yeah, I agree. What cameras are you using? Uh, I am using. Um, a Sony a7 III for the down shot there. Um, I stole my partner's uh, 70 to 200 lens, um, the nice one. So I'm using that. Sweet. Um, the other camera is a Panasonic GH5S, which it's, it's hard for me to say, but I think I almost like it better than the Sony. That thing is custom built for video. Um, it's It's got a super, super low megapixel comparative to most uh, cameras that are out right now. So it works really well in low ISO. Um, the, flat, uh, the flat color profile of it is wonderful to work with um, and it's tiny. So it's like, it you know, it's really, really easy to manage. I actually have it on a I've been trying to figure out a good solution for this. I don't know if you can see this. I have it on like a, a ultimate support tripod mount. Oh, okay, that's for cool. A, for a, for a uh, what do you call it? A, a microphone. And I got a little adapter to put it on there, so I can uh, I can put it in almost any situation. And there's like a giant counterweight on this thing, so uh, you re usually I don't have to deal with any camera shake. It's it's a pretty nice little weird setup set for that. Because with Modular, it's like. You have to, if you have something like that's down here or something like that, or if like you need to get in and get it nicely, uh, you know, straight on something, you kind of have to deal with like armature in some way. And a lot of the camera armature stuff that you can buy out there is at least at a reasonable price point is very poorly made. Like it's not good <laughs> yeah. at all. Yeah. So this is kind of the best solution I found so far. Yeah, that's really cool. I dig it. So you said you're teaching five to six days a week. I mean, are you talking like, 40 hours a week of teaching? No, um, my, my hours are set, uh, what I consider reasonably. Um, okay. I usually start at like, um, so the only days I teach full day, like normal sort of office hours are Monday and Friday. 
Yeah. So Monday from eight to four, um, Friday from eight to four with like hour long chunks and 30 minutes in between plus like time for lunch. Um, when I first started doing it, I booked all the lessons like back to back. I didn't think about putting time in between. Like, yeah. And it was about a week for me to fix that. That was a really <laughs> dumb idea. Starving. Yeah. Um, and then on Tuesdays, I, I go until about noon. Um, and then Wednesday, I have a midweek day off to work on um, whatever I need to. It's a nice like sort of like catch up on email, like work on projects kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, Thursday I pick up at, uh, afternoon. Um, and then, you know, like I already said on Friday and then Saturday I've got half a day. So it's, it's a really chill schedule. Um, overall, uh, like I find it extremely manageable and I've actually started taking uh, the beginning of the month to myself, um, a few days at least to, uh, like really get ahead on everything I possibly can. Um, uh, and, and just take a little mental break from the teaching stuff. Cause it can be just mentally taxing, not because like, like I don't like it. It's just you're putting you're you're in doing a lot of engagement. Um, you're yeah. in your brain quite a lot, so it can get can get a little taxing on the old noggin. That's very active work. Yeah. Have you? So you've been collecting data. I would have to say about like frequent questions and like mm -hmm. things that come up over and over again. So could you maybe give some insight into a few of those? Yeah, I uh, actually made, let me pull it up real quick. I actually made a, like, here are a selection of uh, topics. Uh, one of the things that I think is really, really important for people to understand is uh, this concept of genre. Um, you know, like, what, does diff what do different genres of music sound like and what are their techniques? Um, what are their hallmarks? Um, and I, I come to like, not everybody agrees with that. I, I remember talking about it in a video and I got a lot of comments saying like, Oh, I don't want to copy anything. I'm like, well, it's not really like that. It's like <laughs> a lot of people come to songwriting with this. The, one of the main blockers is how do I take a loop and turn it into a song? Where do I go from here with this? Yeah. And knowing, no, having a, a good understanding of genre allows you to place what you've done in a sort of like context and then ask yourself, what in that context are the techniques um, and like either in arrangement or, or composition that are used to push this kind of music uh, around, um, you know, in three minutes of time or whatever. Um, so the, sort of like, like breaking down what makes a piece of music what it is so that you can sort of like slurp that up and be able to deploy it down the line, I think is one of the main, main number one tools that like musicians and, and producers should have, um, you know, like it's, it's, it's something that like, if you were in any other art form, I think people would not question this as a thing. It's like, Oh, I want to be a sculptor. It's like, okay, well, you're going to study like Learn the masters. all the different types. Yeah, you're going to study all the different types of sculpture, and that might not be where you end up as a, as someone who does uh, sculpting as a as an artist. But by God, like it's part of the training. Like you, mm -hmm. you need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a big one, um, and and I think it's something that even I still practice today. Like you know, when I hear a song that uh, challenges what I've heard before and I like it, I'm like, what is going on here? Like, how would I do that? Um, and it's fun. It's fun as hell, especially when you're actually able to execute it down, the, execute on it down the line and feel like you actually like, you know, you've succeeded in understanding what makes that thing, what it is. Yeah. You're reverse engineering it. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a big one. Um, and it looks like my, <laughs> my songwriting and creativity, st uh, topic starters are all pretty much, um, about that, like genre analysis, learning how to listen actively, um, song breakdowns, um, overcoming, you know, uh, sort of the loops into full tracks issue. Um, and then there's stuff that's like a little bit more, a lot of people like have issues with drum programming, which is interesting to me. Um, mm. so for those people, I usually suggest to start a lot of this comes back to like active listening and reverse engineering. It's like, you can't do something if you don't know how to describe it necessarily. So you have to like listen to tracks that have aspects of them that you like and mm -hmm. start trying to describe them best you can. If you hit a wall with your ability to describe it with the production language that you have, then it's time to either 
throw a bunch of stuff at the wall until you figure it out or like do a sideways bit of research. Like how else can I look into this topic? Like, is there an article about like this album or like, is there a forum post where people are talking about how this album was made or the song was made? There's usually so much information out there. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's pretty, really crazy. Um, so yeah, uh, if anyone is stuck with drum programming, just just listen and and try to figure out what's going on there, or or try to learn how to play drums. Like that's what helped me. Like so, I, I started watching a bunch of drum instructional videos. Yeah, and like once you start getting it under your hands and really starting to like immerse yourself in that world of like yep. how a drummer thinks or listening to them. Like I watched like Mike Portnoy's. I don't I don't know if you if you're familiar with him. But His name sounds really familiar. Drummer for Dream Theater. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he's just like, you know, like showing how he's like breaking down these different sections of like different time signatures. And it's just like when you start to like really like hear a lot of that stuff, you start to like it makes sense. Like, oh, okay. You're or, absolutely like, right. Yeah. Like there's a physicality to drumming that uh and and it's sort of just like I don't know, that's the best way to describe it. I mean, it's a it's a physical yeah. thing. And even if you're sitting down in front of a drum machine, you can bring that physicality and that drummer mentality to that machine and make it feel like mm -hmm. feel good like fills the entire concept of how like contrast is created with different drum uh with different drums to, uh, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word symbols and stuff like that i agree with you like like understanding how a drummer works and thinks uh will go so far in being yeah. able to program drums better yeah it, and that goes for like so many different things even like you know for people who you know like a lot of people who who buy our products are aspiring composers and learning how an orchestra works i mean mm -hmm. that's even harder because it's like not only is it like the orchestra itself it's like you know you get the different sections and everything and so it's like trying to like you know not write what they can't do or you know it's like it that yeah like learning just how things work the rules from like the yeah like learn the rules and then yeah then you can mess and with then break them <laughs> yeah, yeah like like yeah but totally it's 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 insane to think that you know you you would expect yourself to be able to sit down and execute on something as complex as orchestral composition without understanding orchestral composition. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just like most people, they just hear like, what is going on? Or like, you know, but it's like, I don't know. I'm just, trying, you know, that's where like the throwing, throwing shit at the wall. And, you know, and then like when you listen back or you, you know, you're like, oh yeah, that was not, not the greatest thing to do. Totally. All right. Then you like really start to just understand it more and more. And then it becomes easier. Sometimes executing, and getting it wrong will give you the ability to hear what's hear that it's wrong and then mm -hmm. ask yourself like why yeah unfortunately like not everybody has room for a drum set i was very lucky when i was younger um and my parents tolerated me having sort of behind their back purchased a friend's uh old <laughs> drum set and setting nice. it up in the garage you're just like bringing it in one piece at a time <laughs> <laughs> I was more overt than that, but like, yeah, the sound was not, uh, was not very well, um, hidden. One of the hardest parts about video is being on camera and like putting your face and just like saying lines to the camera, like the, yeah. the all seeing eye. So I don't know if you have any tips for people on that. Like if you're trying to sure. get started on YouTube, what, what's the game plan? Well, um, I think if you look at a well, well, we'll talk about that first. I mean, the game the game plan is a lot more complicated than that. But well, not succeeding like commercially on YouTube, but just getting started and doing it. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, well, non technically getting started, um, having a, a and this is something that I say from experience of not having this, having a sort of clear idea of of kind of what you want your channel and your vibe to be can be really really helpful. Um, yeah. I. I, I'm all over the place, right? Like, I mean, it seems as if I am. Like, I mean, I think now that I've been doing modular stuff and other stuff for a while, I think people are starting to understand that, like, this channel is is more diverse than it used to be, and hopefully that's a calling card for it. Um, but I also see some channels that are just, like, what feel like laser focused to me on their subject matter, and they execute on that. Now, there, I think there's different types of YouTube channels and how they present their information or their entertainment. Um, YouTube would like us all to sort of be like TV shows, like, you know, like right. that's what they want from us. They want everything that you put out to kind of be an episode. Like, you know, there's a channel I found recently called like weird history. And, you know, they have like all these videos on the history of food and they're all structured very similarly and they're all very snappy and fun kind of content that you might see on, you know, mm -hmm. on, on, on television. That's not really possible for most people, um, but I think it is possible to come in understanding that like consistency 
in some way is probably going to be helpful to you. Um, so that your audience understands what to expect from your channel. If they watch like five videos and don't know what the hell your channel is about, then they may not subscribe um, because they probably arrived based on a video that they did like and they're looking for more of that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know about y'all, but like once I find a video on a channel that I like, I usually go to that channel and I look for the playlist that has more videos like that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's another thing you can do is, is if you do have a bunch of videos that are maybe disparate in their in their type of content, um, really utilize that playlist function so that you can create buckets that people can uh, can go into and, and enjoy and uh, mm -hmm. you know make use of those end cards so that people are directed to that if they do end up watching your whole video, uh, which is rare. <laughs> mm -hmm. In terms of presentation, um, obviously there's a lot of different ways you can present information. You mentioned camera, face, camera, sort of thing. You don't have to do that. Um, faces do engage people more often, um, which is why we have, you know, the YouTube thumbnail face. No. Um, <laughs> you know I mean? and, it's real. And obviously people engage with faces. It's, it's just sort of something that we do. So if you are putting yourself in front of a camera, try to get some, some, you know, make the lighting look at least pretty good. Like, you know, I think, I think both of you have a great example of, of two different types of lighting that work really, really, really well. Looks, it looks nice, especially with like the blurred background on, on yours, Nathan, like that looks mm -hmm. really nice. Um, but, and, and then obviously Craig, yours has just like insane amounts of vibe. So both oh, of those look you. fantastic. Um, mine looks like shit, but I don't film from here. So <laughs> it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, so some level of competency, competency in terms of, of lighting, um, and video quality and, uh, audio quality, I think are really, really important. It's become so easy to make things look at least semi-decently good. Um, you know, these led panels I have all over the, the room here are on Amazon and they cost like almost nothing. I mean, they're like they're 60 bucks for like four of them or something. And I can like change their, Oh, that looks like shit, but I can like change the color. Um, I can like vibe out or I can just have, you know, regular lighting. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, you know, finding cheap and, and cool ways to, you know, give your, give your space, uh, some light and some, some vibes professionally or creatively is, is really important. And then in terms of audio, yeah, you probably want to learn at least enough about audio production to like make your voice sound, you know, kind of good. Um, it, it, if you do like a couple searches online, I'm sure most people can find information about that, you know, um, just like basic chains to, uh, to do that kind of, uh, audio cleaning up and a little bit of compression and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially being able to treat your room if you can, if you, you know, can, that'll go a long ways. Yeah. yeah. Did you make your panels? No, I bought them from Acoustamat. Um, nice. yeah, they're kind of all in weird positions right now because, of having to redo my room. Like I need to, oh, I need to yeah. like complete, once we get the roof um, fixed, I will probably redo all the panels in this room because just in weird places right now, but they do help. I don't, I don't have any slap back in here, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's always a, a huge help when it comes to like voiceover stuff, just because like when you have all that echo or even, you know, like for just basic recording. Yep. Just, just being able to like control that stuff, or, or, you know, or if you want to liven it up, and you could just take them down. You know, it's yeah. just it's cool to have that option. I and I turned off the you know fan that I have for like AC or whatever. Or uh, while we were talking earlier, um, yeah, like think about that stuff. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I hear a lot of YouTubers that I that I watch who do you know talking to the camera stuff mention every now and then in their videos, like, oh, I had to I had to turn off the fans in my room to do this, and it's boiling hot. It's like, well, yeah. Suffer for good audio quality. <laughs> <laughs> People forgive bad video more than bad audio. For sure. I certainly do. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the times I'm actually uh, listening to YouTube videos rather than watching them. That's mm -hmm. a lot of the content that I consume um, is is sort of more audio based than it is mm -hmm. video based. You mentioned the, the pressure of being in front of a camera and, and delivering that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'd say don't worry too much about always having to nail the full statement, uh, like the, like, like, like a whole, like multiple paragraph statement. Mm -hmm. We live in a, in a, a world where like we expect edits, uh, in, in video content like that. So as long as you're not making a, an edit, like every sentence, like as long as you can get through like a, a thought, <laughs> yeah. uh, without a, a break, then the people watching will be able to follow along. It's when the editing becomes obtrusive that, and like literally like separates like 
thoughts, um, you know, it's almost like what I did right there. I, I would probably go back and try to re-say that again in in a single take. Um, so a lot of the editing that I do is like I'll start to say something, I'll trip over what I'm saying, I'll stop, I'll think about like the best place to pick up what I was just saying, and I'll I'll say it from there, and then I know mm-hmm. that I can just edit that together. Yeah, it's kind of like that vlog style editing that almost exactly. started. It almost started becoming like a popular like people probably started doing it on purpose or just seeing how, mm. you know, Casey Neistat would, would do a video or something. And then like trying to almost recreate that or like, or people do the, the thing where they like go in different locations, like mm-hmm. be, like saying one thing and then they like pick up the conversation, like in a park and then mm-hmm. they're like on a subway or something, you know? So it's like, That's there's so, so many much work. creative ways you can do it, and, like, <laughs> make it your own. Yeah, I know. It's like, like you probably have like a whole script. You're like, all right, now I got to say this thing here. I got to drive to the park, you know, 20 minutes. And it's like, <laughs> There are a couple like sort of like edutainment uh, YouTubers um, who I've seen do that in their content quite often. And I'm like, they, they have to have it. They have a team like they don't just do that on their own. A lot of the times they usually have somebody working with them. And that's another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of people who you think are solo acts on YouTube are, are actually like hiring people to help them either edit or which mm-hmm. is the most common one or shoot and edit. Um, I'm amazed at how many people who are, and this isn't a metric necessarily of success, but who have like hundreds of thousands of less subscribers than me who are paying someone to edit their videos. And I'm like, you should learn how to love to edit. It's fun. <laughs> you should just do it. But some people just don't want to do it. And and that's that's totally cool. Um, but don't yeah. don't get down on yourself because like, you know, you can't pull off like the kind of stuff that you're seeing on some of the bigger channels is because they they actually have a team working mm-hmm. on their stuff. Um you can try and and you know, God bless you if you actually get it. God bless you. Um, so you've been in, you've been educating and doing creative work in public online for like 10 years. Can you talk about some of the pros and cons of that? And has it been a net positive for you to be working in public, showing your work? Yeah, I, I think 99.9% positive. Um, I would be nowhere if it wasn't for the attention uh, that the YouTube video, the YouTube channel got. Um, no one would give a, a rat's ass about my music. No one would give a rat's ass about what I have to say about anything if uh, that stupid little Swedish synthesizer hadn't sucked them all in. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, you mentioned it earlier. It's like, you know, if, if you are working in music, you are doing something special. And I, I have to remind myself every day when I wake up, like, yeah, guess what? You're, you're doing that. Like it, it's all good. Like it's so hard to reach an escape velocity with a lot of like professional stuff, you know, like, like actually getting into a position where what you're doing is something that you actually believe in. Um, and that alone is worth so much. Um, and, and that's why I say it's like 99.9% positive. Um, it's just amazing to be able to do this, (laughs) do this as a, as a thing. Yeah, especially when you're trying to explain it to somebody like, oh, so what do you do for a living? And like <laughs> to, to most people, they're just like that. That doesn't sound like a job, like especially when you're talking about it and you're smiling about it. like, yeah, I get to do this. I get to play with cool gear and, you know, help people along the way. And, you know, they're like I work in HR department. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't want to knock. I don't want to knock anybody that has like a, an office job that likes it. Um, it's just when I think about going back to something like that, I. I, I literally have a panic attack. It's like, oh God, if I have to re-enter right. the normal workforce after doing this, I yeah. don't know how I would survive. Yeah, that's like me with warehouse work, dude. I was doing that for mm. like over 10 years. And like the idea of like hopping back on a forklift, well, that might be a little fun. Yeah, but. I mean, don't, I, th- I think being forklift certified is one of the greatest things you could possibly be in this day and age. Yeah, but it's <laughs> like, man, like, I don't want to go back. Yeah. Yeah, once you've, once you've reached it. that escape velocity, it's, it's, it's difficult to, it's so difficult to comprehend returning to that thing. And I hope this doesn't sound like elitist or anything like that. Cause that's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Here. I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that like, you will find a way to continue w- doing this, like, like mm-hmm. what you've reached. Like, I think, I think there's sort of like a survival mentality. It's like, okay, well, how could I pivot to like something else that's similar to this, that, that, you know, if, if the gig that you have right now falls through, my, that's my mm-hmm. mindset. It's like, 
okay, if I have to, if I have to like stop doing, you know, education and YouTube, it's like, do I have any form of exit strategy that still involves working in, in music or, you know, music education, stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. and so like, you just kind of, you kind of think about it, you kind of like keep it on the back burner and, I think the more that you like engage with the community and the more that you sort of do this kind of stuff, the more options you see uh, available to uh, to use these skills in a professional mm -hmm. environment. So you said you don't pay any attention to the metrics on YouTube, but have you had any sort of like huge spikes in growth or like anything that you can attribute to, oh, I did this and this happened? Like, because you've been posting for like 10 years, over 10 years. Yeah. I mean, are, were there like specific moments you can kind of pinpoint looking back? I, I pay attention to the view count on a video, um, like right at the beginning. And then like, you know, I'll, I'll check on it a few days later to see how it's doing just to get a sense of where my average is. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't really know what to do with that information, <laughs> like in terms mm -hmm. of like changing what I do to make things more uh, digestible by the algorithm for lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah. But I do keep an eye on that stuff just to kind of know where I'm at. The the biggest spikes that I saw were at the beginning of the, uh, the OP1 stuff. Obviously all of that was sort of a, a meteoric rise, uh, in terms of engagement and, um, and subscribers. I mean, that's when you look at my subscriber count now, that's where primarily most of those people came from. So that again was sort of just like, yeah, these are going to do well no matter when I put it out. Like it just, it just would. And that was just sort of like we're landing on a, a winning formula, you know, like yeah. uh, lucky enough. Riding a big wave. Yeah, exactly. There was, a, when I first moved to, back to Seattle, like five years ago, I was, I was un unemployed while looking for a job and I put together a, a video. It was the, it was the, remember the show Narcos? I don't know if that's yeah, still yeah. around. It was the Narcos intro, but it was with dogs and it was called Barcos. And it was basically just it. a way to like. <laughs> it's really good. That, it's really good. I have not I, seen that, but I want to watch it now. I basically just threw myself at After Effects like insanely hard. Like it was like, okay, well, you know, I, I should have like, I don't really have like a, a piece that shows off that I know After Effects. So it's like, okay, this, this is going to be it. Um, and that took off pretty hard. That was my first taste of like weird viral like yeah, like yeah. because like lad bible and shit like that were like can we have your video and like it's just it was it hit this very interesting second uh version of of viral sort of spiking that i had not seen before mm -hmm. um and then uh that's pretty much it i don't feel like i've really had like a lot of super spiky spiky things um okay. at this point i'm just kind of just puttering along basically like I think you have two choices. You can you can follow the sort of like advice that uh, full screen one of the MCNs that you know used to exist um, gave me, which is like chase all the trending topics and make something around that. You can do that if you want. That sounds fucking exhausting, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Or uh, and this is what I believe in. You can you can be true to yourself and sort of like do the things we talked about earlier with the, the quality filming and audio and stuff like that. Um, and do what you really love. And I hope to God that that actually continues to be something that draws people in as opposed to just the, the other stuff, the, the mm -hmm. noise that exists on the platform. Yeah. I know people kind of have to figure out some sort of balance with that. Like I know some people do, I do two videos that feed the algorithm and one for me or mm. like, or like, as my interests evolve, I just hope that my audience follows. And the same thing goes for bands and albums too. It's yep. like we put an album out two years later and we just kind of hope that those people still like our music because we made a completely different album. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's a great way of putting it. Um, with YouTube, you're basically like constantly putting out singles and hoping, hoping that one, you don't get tired of the type of music that you're making and two, um, your audience appreciates derivations on the formula. Um, yeah, they're, they're on, there's just like hyper fast music releasing sort of almost. Yeah. And you have to wonder how, like how ever, like never ending is the appetite for OP1 videos. Like, is it exactly is it, right? Is it bottomless? Because <laughs> <laughs> your, your interest in that is not bottomless as right. a, uh, as a creator of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I could not imagine that that type of, 
that specific type of video would have continued to be as popular up until now. Like it's just, it's impossible for me to consider that, but maybe it's just inconceivable to me and therefore I can't, I can't conceive of it. <laughs> Are you going to get a hold of the, is it the OP2 field? The, the new, field? Whatever the, yeah. The new, the new piece of kit. I'm hopefully going to get one in the studio one way or another. Um, uh, I really, really want to do a sort of technical deep dive on it. Uh, like a very like sort of review review because holy moly, that thing really set people off. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, including like it, it, it's wild, like the ripples of the OP ones fields release, like really tore people's head open in terms of like, like conspicuous consumption and, and their problems with capitalism. I saw it in my discord, saw it online. I saw all this stuff happening where people just lost their minds. And I'm like, yeah, they were upset. They were really upset. I'm like, why are you mad at the synthesizer? You're so <laughs> mad at the synthesizer. I'm sure they I'm sure the company was thinking the same thing. Like, what's happening right now? They probably are aware of uh, I think I think it would be very difficult for them not to be aware of the position that they are in, considering the things that they have released. Yeah. Um but yeah, uh, so yeah, I, hopefully we'll get it in the studio and, and I'll be able to do like some kind of, you know, comparison sort of technical review because no one has done that yet. And as, as far as I know, um, and I think, I think that would be a very interesting way to kind of objectify the device and, and talk about it in a more, a less emotional way, <laughs> a more, right. a more right. thorough way. Absolutely, man. Well, I have a few more quick questions sure. and then we can wrap this up. Um, the first one is, do you have a favorite YouTube channel, podcast, or TV show at the moment you've been enjoying? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so, uh, there's a YouTube channel called the exploring series that, okay. uh, is 99% focused on doing good, good reads, um, and sort of like deep dives into, uh, these things called SCPs. I don't know if either of you are familiar with the SCP universe. Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> So the SCP, I'm not going to explain it too much, but like basically it's a collaborative online fiction thing. There's a wiki for it. And it's sort of like this, this universe where a organization exists to contain the anomalous. So the articles are all written sort of like as in their entries for these anomalous things, which sounds very kind of small, but the, the, the canon and the, the, the collaboration between people has made this a huge universe. And I like weird science fiction to death. So this person um, is a great example of consistency because like every week they have a new SCP or a canon or um, something related to the universe that they, they don't just read the entry. They actually like extrapolate on it and place it within the context of the rest of the, um, the sort of metaverse of the SCP thing. Um, and I just can't get enough of that shit. I, I love it to death. <laughs> so it's like, it's like story time kind of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, in terms of podcasts, I listen to my brother, my brother and me quite a bit. I don't know if you're all familiar with that. The yeah. Mattel Roy's love, love those boys. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of like my main, my main long form consumption stuff. Perfect. Do you have a best recent purchase under a hundred dollars? Ooh. Um, do I? Give me a second. <laughs> I'm looking around. I know I bought something that's useful. <laughs> I just don't know if I have it in here. I learned that there's a there's a, a no type of MIDI that I did not even know about, and this is the expression pedal to MIDI. Okay. Um, MIDI is hell, uh, and this is one that goes in a guitar pedal. <laughs> it's like oh. TRS to five pin MIDI, uh, and I, I got a pair of pedals recently that apparently this is how they get MIDI. So um, yeah, I'm gonna see how that works out. <laughs> So yeah. you're, it's like a foot pedal and it's going to do expression or what, what's it going to do? So, no, it's a, do I have it? I'm not going to pull it out. It's the, um, <laughs> Alexander pedals makes, uh, two very, very cool pedals. This, uh, syntax error and, um, fever pitch. Um, both of them are clockable. Uh, okay. So they'll take clock via USB, which is actually pretty damn cool, but to feed the MIDI clock, which I would need to use with like other hardware, Instead of having a MIDI DIN in, they have a quarter inch expression pedal in, um, and that cable goes into the pedal and then has five pin MIDI DIN on the other side. So you can like plug it into like a MIDI sequencer and send a clock to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I had no idea that there was like 
TRS Timidity. Um, and apparently there's like three different kinds. So I hopefully I got the right kind because <laughs> I have no idea what's going on with that shit. <laughs> Are you going to try a video on it? Uh, yeah. Um, both of the pedals it? from them. Uh, I tend to do a video on the syntax error. I don't know. I mean, it's like we have some guitar players in, in the house. The The uh-huh. syntax error is really, really interesting. Um, the yeah. microcosm has long been my like favorite pedal for transformative audio, but the syntax error is giving it a run for its money. It's got like a little sequencer built into it and stuff like that, which is really, really interesting. Oh, that's cool. Sounds wild, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. My last question for you is what goals do you see yourself achieving in the next few years or what's next for you basically? Um, I will be the first to tell you that I am terrible at planning goals. Um, it, it feels, it feels like even though I'm a lot less like frantic than I used to be, that it's pretty much just get through, get through the day, see how things are going. Like, okay. um, <laughs> if I've got a project that, uh, you know, is on the horizon or that takes a, a while to execute, then that's my focus. And, and that's what I'm working on. But yeah, I, I would like to see growth in the channel. I'd like to see growth in, in, you know, the Patreon and lesson stuff. Um, and I'd like to see where this sort of goes. Um, there's so much happens like every month in terms of like a new, a new person reaching out to talk about something or something like yeah. that. Like I sort of try to just put stuff out there and and then see what comes back, if anything. Um, and then if I get into a dry spell where like I feel like things aren't moving forward, then I, I figure out something to do to help move things forward, whether or not that's like, you know, a new project that I think will be very interesting to people or um, reaching out to someone that I worked with before and seeing if they wanted to do something together. I hate to say that like I'm stagnant because I'm not, but I'm just not like actively, actively planning anything, uh, anything big outside of do good stuff. And hopefully that will be good. <laughs> Yeah. No, I totally understand. I mean, you're just putting one foot in front of the other yeah. and seeing what happens and, re- and you're like reacting to things mm-hmm. as they, as they kind of invade your space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just keep saying yes to stuff, you know, just like no, you've been doing, trying absolutely. new things. That's, that's what keeps it fresh and new opportunities come up all the time. So that, you know, that's cool that you're always just kind of like open to trying new things because it seems like it's that's, working for you. That's where the magic happens is, yeah. is bringing in new energy and, and seeing how it fits with what, you, what you've already done and what you can do. Well, Jeremy, this has been so much fun, man. Thank you for taking the time and coming on the old Sound Iron podcast. Heck yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I love what you all are doing. Um, I, I have a bunch of your products already and uh, I was like tickled to find out that it was... It was you that uh, that wanted to talk. It's it's cool. If anyone hasn't checked out your your libraries for contact and stuff like that, it's definitely worth doing. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. See you, Jeremy. Bye bye.